Turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy 26, verse 18. Deuteronomy 26, 18. <clears throat> the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit Give us the concentration necessary to assimilate this portion of the word of God into our stream of consciousness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Deuteronomy 26, 18 through 19. And the Lord has today declared you to be his people, a people for his own treasured possession. As he promised you, therefore, you are to keep all his commandments, and that he will set you high above all nations which he made for praise, fame, and honor, and that you shall be a set-apart people to the Lord your God as he has spoken. This verse not only applies to client nation Israel, but it also applies to Gentile client nations to God, of which is the United States of America. The commandments are a bit different. In Deuteronomy, they were under the Old Testament covenant, the covenant to Israel. Now we're under the covenant to the church, in other words, post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation, but that does not preclude the fact that in the book of Acts it states, this is the time of the Gentiles. And that means this is the time of Gentile client nations to God including the United States of America. There are two categories of client nations to God in human history. There were, in fact, five Jewish client nations. And there were five of them. They were all Jewish, and they were all different. Now, they were in the same area, but they were different in terms of the time in history in which they formed, how they formed, and what occurred. Now, if the United States were to go under, that's it. There will never, ever again be a United States. Period. It's over. Just as there is no more Great Britain. They're gone. Great Britain, though you may say it, that's part of history. It doesn't exist. The United Kingdom exists, and that simply means the island, a very small island in the Atlantic, is united. Scotland to the north and the England to the south. They are both united under the United Kingdom and under the British flag. And they, of course, own a few islands here and there, but other than that, their glory's gone. So Great Britain, client nation to God, obviously. Someone asked a historian in the United Kingdom, what's the greatest thing that the United Kingdom ever gave to the world? And he answered quickly, the United States of America. And that's because we now are a client nation to God. And a greater one than Great Britain could ever imagine, though the sun never did set on the Union Jack, no matter we are the greatest nation on the face of the earth. We rival the Roman Empire. So there are two categories of client nations to God in human history. Jewish client nations, of which there were five, they had a specialized priesthood. And one thing you can note about the priesthood in client nation Israel is there could be unbelieving priests and believing priests. It all was bound up in genetics. Were you of the tribe of 
tribe of Levi or not, etc. But in the church age, we have a universal priesthood. Everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ becomes a royal priest. And that means universal priesthood and universal church in terms of the fact that everyone who believes in Christ becomes part of the church. And that just shows how evil denominations are. Now, the Catholic Church claims we are the universal church. No, you are not. In fact, many of you aren't even believers. The universal church is every single person who has made one choice to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter where you go to church. doesn't matter what you call yourself. If you believe in Christ, you're part of the universal priesthood. You're part of the universal church. There is no communion that you have to follow to be part of the church. Although it is commanded as part of our spiritual life, you don't have to be part of it to be part of the church. You're part of the church by means of God the Holy Spirit entering you into union with Christ who is the head of the church. No Gentile nation of the Old Testament was a client nation to God. There was influence of a pivot to areas uh, that had, uh, for, for example, Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar, by the way, became a believer, and so did others in that nation. So they were blessed by association with the Jew, but they were not a client nation. The Gentile client nation category follows, however, the same pattern as Israel. But there are dramatic differences, and that's all related to the church age. For there is a grace provision, and we have a unique spiritual life that never existed in Israel. And that means to whom much is given, much is expected. And it also means even greater blessing for client Gentile client nations. Some of you may look back at Israel and say, it would be nice to be back there. Uh, some of you uh, would want to take a trip to Israel. I like to travel, so it wouldn't bother me to go there. I would enjoy seeing it, but it's still not Israel, really, not anymore. It is a conglomeration of mostly unbelievers and a few believers here and there in their country that is constantly under attack because they are meant to be dispersed, the diaspora. And that has occurred. There are more Jews in the United States than are in Israel. And they are not a client nation to God. They are to be our ally. And we are not to be anti-Semitic. And a lot of the problems that we're facing now is because we stupidly, well, we've moved from the top to bottom toward anti-Semitism. In total ignorance, people had no idea what they were getting into some time ago. Well, there are two categories of a client nation in human history, again, Israel and the and in the church age, it's all Gentile client nation. And a client nation is a synonym for a priest nation. The name priest nation is used for Israel because it had a specialized priesthood. The term client nation is used for the Gentile nations. And it does perform the same type of functions during the church age. For example, in Roman history, a client was someone dependent on another family. Instead of, you know, uh, well, wherever you work, you may call your customers clients. Why? You're dependent upon that client's money as a businessman. That's why the customer is always right. Not because they're a customer, but because they have money. And you want it. And you want to make a profit. So you treat them kindly because you want their money. Now, Client nation is used for any Gentile nation that performs the same functions during the church age. And we are a client of God. We need him. He doesn't need us. That's the principle. Just as Walmart needs us to buy their products, 
We need God to bless us. Now, Walmart has clients, and who would that be? It would be me. I love Walmart. There's a movement against Walmart, and that's just anti-establishment weirdos. And in some areas where liberalism reigns supreme, they don't allow a Walmart. Why? They hate capitalism. But Walmart is doing what's best for the client. That's why they are so popular. They offer cheaper products. So that's where I go. And that's where most people go. Even rich people. Why? Cheaper. And good quality. The quality is not different. In fact, it may be even better. But it's still cheaper. Now, as a client, we are God's client. And the Gentile client nation category follows exactly the same pattern as Israel. Now, in the church age, we have a set-apart priesthood, a holy priesthood, and a royal family to God found in 1 Peter 2, 5, 2, 4 through 5. I mentioned 1 Peter in the last message, and this is the exact passage. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5. And coming to him as a living stone, rejected by men, but elect and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are built up into a spiritual house as a result of a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through the agency of Jesus Christ. Now, what's that mean? I could read that. I could read that to you all day long, and you may never know what it means. That's why there is the gift of pastor teacher to tell you what it means. And you probably have no clue sitting there listening and coming to him as to a living stone to whom? Well, Jesus Christ. Well, see, first of all, you have to know what that pronoun him is referring to, the second member of the Trinity. And coming to him as a living stone, or actually it's uh, God the Father, Jesus Christ, coming to God the Father as a living stone. What is that? That's the prototype spiritual life. That is our Lord Jesus Christ living in perfection upon the earth for 33 years. What happened? Rejected by men. But elect and precious in the sight of God. Who is elect and precious in the sight of God? The Lord Jesus Christ. Then it says, you also, as living stones. Okay, we had living stone, and now we have living stones. Now what's that? Protocol. We live the same unique spiritual life the living stone lived. We are living stones. The living stone lived the prototype. We live the protocol are being built up into a spiritual house as a result of a holy priesthood. All of us, when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we become a priest. You represent yourself before God, and this is where the Catholics go way off. And they say there's a certain priesthood for the church, just as there was in Israel. They are so confused, it's unbelievable. There were, there was a tribe in Israel composed of priests. Not anymore. And the Catholics are trying to live by the old covenant mixed in with a lot of Indian tradition, especially in this era, in this country, and especially in Mexico. Do you know a Catholic in Mexico is totally different from a Catholic in Europe? Because a Catholic in Mexico has a lot of voodoo mixed up in it due to the Indian culture. And the missionaries who failed, who came from Europe to Mexico as Catholics, they would give them uh, what they knew. And they would not respond. And so they would observe their rituals, their the type of things that they would do in their pagan religions. And in one of the pagan religions, they had a mother-type God. And I forget what the name of it was. I saw it on the History Channel. 
But do you know that uh, the Mother Mary wasn't such a big deal until it started to spread over here, in which the Indians had a mother-type God, and so in order to pull them into the Catholic Church, they compromised and they said, we have one too. She's called the Mother Mary. And they bought into that. Why? It's just another religion. They didn't have to believe in Christ or anything. They just bought into another religion. And if you go to Mexico today, they believe in ghosts and everything else. And voodoo, and yet they're all Catholic. And you would say they're Christian. They are not. They're religious. They are mystical. They're still following part of their Indian traditions of the past. They're not Christians. They haven't believed in Christ, most of them. Some of them have. Most of them have not. Now, Israel was always called a holy nation. And the church is called a holy priesthood. And that's because in the church age, every believer is a priest. You don't have to go up to someone who calls himself a priest and tell him your sins because he represents you before God. That's how it was in the Old Testament. And that's why Job was able to confess the sins of his sons and daughters. Because he was the priest. He represented his entire family before God. Not only his family, but even his friends. Because God asked Job to pray a rebound prayer for his friends. And he did. It would have been funny if he said, nah, these people, I don't care. They were against me the whole time. But you see, bitterness is awful. Job was not bitter because his friends abandoned him in his greatest time of need. And that's always what happens. In your greatest time of need, people want to attack. Whether it's your fault or not. And it really doesn't matter whether it was your fault or not. If the person is grace-oriented, they understand. And they function in a compassionate manner. And they leave it up to God to do the discipline. And I guarantee you, he does a wonderful job. He's done a wonderful job on me, and I'm sure he's done a wonderful job on you. And then there are times when he hasn't disciplined me at all, because everyone else wanted to wag their tongue. Well, go ahead. Now, there was one idiot I've talked to in the past. He said, you know what? I try to get people to talk about me because I don't ever want discipline. Now, you're a retard. You are someone who doesn't know how to apply doctrine. You have no idea what you're talking about. You are so far outside the unique spiritual life, it's unbelievable, and you're going to be punished anyway. Now, Jesus Christ tested and proved the proto prototype spiritual life, and that's what 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5 is about. And what is that where it says, as a result of a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices? We don't sacrifice anything in the church, do we? Now, we have people and uh, churches who claim we must sacrifice, we must bear our own cross, but they don't even know what they're talking about. It does say bear our own cross, but it's referencing you live the unique spiritual life just as our Lord lived it. And what did our Lord say about the unique spiritual life? My burden is light. My yoke is easy. It's not legalism. You can't follow legalism. Legalism is cruel. Legalism is man-made and extremely cruel. Because under legalism, they try to take control of you through guilt manipulation and impose upon you a list of rules that they can't even follow themselves. It's discouraging, not encouraging. And these people running around now talking about, I have the gift of encouragement. I have the gift of exhortation. You're not exhortating anyone. You're under legalism, and you're trying to tell people what to do from a position of arrogance. There is no such gift. I don't care who has taught it. 
Jesus Christ tested him. Why do I shout? Sometimes you have to shout to dumb sheep. Not that you are. Some people are. Jesus Christ tested and proved the prototype spiritual life. Given it to us in the form of the protocol and the spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God are the four spiritual mechanics of the unique spiritual life. And what are those? If you can't name them, then perhaps you're not living by them. What are the four spiritual mechanics? I'll let you think about it. Can you get at least one of the four? Well, the first are the two power options. Do you remember what those are? It's the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, plus Operation Z, the conversion of gnosis into epinosis in the soul. Well, that's the first mechanic. What's the second? That's very simple. And the second mechanic, the only thing you do is add to it the ten problem-solving device. devices. So the second mechanic is the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, plus Operation Z, plus the ten problem-solving devices. So you say, what are the ten problem-solving devices? If you want to know, you can go to the Advanced Essential Series and listen to each and every one of them. In fact, through Essentials and into Advanced, the Advanced Essentials deals with problem-solving devices, six through ten, and the Regular Essentials deals with problem-solving devices, one through five. And if you didn't listen to that, you may not have a clue as to what I'm talking about. And you may have heard it in passing. One thing that I noticed uh, when I uh, was called to preach is that I had to learn a lot more than I, well, I thought I knew a lot more than I really knew until I had to teach it. That's part of it, a little bit of arrogance, but I, I flushed it out. Because I realize, man, I don't know nearly as much as I need to know, and I still don't. We're always learning. If we're on the right path, we're always learning. And that's the big issue, knowledge of doctrine. In Hosea chapter 4, why did Israel go under? Lack of knowledge. It didn't say because they were sinners. It said because they lacked knowledge. Everyone in the world is a sinner. Every nation in the world is filled with sinners. Believers and unbelievers alike, all sinners. And it's not because there's some depravity in the United States that has never been before. There has always been depravity in the United States and around the world. And a lot of that depravity in the past was related to legalism and self-righteousness. We had a lot of that. And this country has had a pilgrim syndrome from legalism that is strange and hypocritical. So strange and hypocritical that uh, unbelievers mock you and, well, no wonder. You don't make any sense. You're hypocrites. You talk about how you shouldn't do this, that, and the other. You heap upon a heavy burden upon the human race. They can't follow it. So they start to look at Christianity as nothing more than another religion. So you're an enemy of the cross because so is religion. And whenever you try to superimpose your values, your norms and standards on someone else, you're a legalist. You have to realize all of us rise or fall before the same master, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we've all judged, we've all maligned, we've all gossiped, we've all been jealous, we've all reacted in jealousy or some emotional sin. But you have to stay away from those just as you would any other overt sin. And you're to stay away from both. Now you're going to commit one or the other, but as soon as you do, name it and move on. Don't make it your lifestyle. When it becomes your lifestyle is when it becomes punishment. And I, what I mean is, do you have a lifestyle of gossip? Punishment will come. You see, you never rebound gossip. You didn't even know it was a sin. And I can say this today, though in the past most people knew it. 
Are you a believer just simply living with someone here and there and hopping from bed to bed? You're out of line. You may not know it, but you are. It's kind of like uh, in the Old Testament. Kings were supposed to have more than one wife according to culture, according to all the cultures of the world. And that's because kings in a, a male king, of course, in a position of authority, well, he was to have luxuries, etc. And part of that was having a multitude of wives because they think of sex as a luxury and to have sexual relations with a lot of people. Well, that's just a multitude of luxuries. Well, that's definitely what Solomon thought. And that's what David thought at first till he got burned. Then he realized, oops, I messed up. The culture of Israel was wrong at the time. Now, Israel thought nothing of David having ten wives. He's the king. He's supposed to have women catering to his every need. And some of you men want to be rich. And uh, with wealth comes a lot of temptation. And part of that is women. Because women are seeking security and money. And you have it. And they don't love you. They love your money. Kind of like the Patsy Klein song I listened to. She wanted uh, the guy's car. She didn't love him. She loved his car. It's a kind of a funny song, but it's true. So a lot of rich men never find what love is all about. And that's what happened to Solomon. Well, David recovered in time to where he had Bathsheba. And he was able to have a relationship with one wife for an extended period of time instead of ten. You cannot have a normal life with ten women around. Imagine if they all got pregnant about the same time. You'd have ten crazy women around, the hormones, etc. And if you put uh, ten women in the same palace, their uh, monthly thing goes in sync. And then you have ten angry women coming at you all at the same time. Hard enough dealing with one. Now, that's not an insult to the women. It's hard enough for you to deal with one man, I understand. Most men today are fools. This isn't sexism. Most men today are fools, just as most women today are silly. And that's the same for today, yesterday, and forever. That will always be the same in human history. Now, Israel was always called a set-apart nation. And the church is called a holy priesthood. And so in 1 Peter 2.9, it says, because, but you are an elect race. Now we're talking about a universal. You're an elect. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and you live in Germany, you're still part of the elect race, part of a royal priesthood. You're part of a set-apart nation. And you are a people for God's own possession. Then you may proclaim the light. And so we have the idea of this elect race, and that comes from kinakatesis. It means new spiritual species. We've studied that in the past. Now, a client nation to God is under divine protection. And that's because of a pivot of mature believers. Those believers who have said, you know what? I believe in Christ. Now I know. Now I want to know what it's all about. And, I, and then you say to yourself, I know it can't be all this hypocrisy that I see around me. I know it can't be found in the churches that I've gone to searching. Searching for an answer. That's what happened immediately after 9-11. Everyone wanted a one-shot solution, and they went to their churches, and their churches did the same. They were just as stunned as everyone else. And then we had people who should know better stumbling around saying, I don't know why this happened. I don't know why it happened. I know why it happened. And so they went to church seeking an answer, and all they got was, I don't know. Why would God want this to happen? I don't know. You should know. A client nation is destroyed by the reversionistic believers, those 
who are not interested in what the Word of God has to say and definitely not interested in applying it to their life. They've rejected Bible doctrine just as an unbeliever. And most believers today act as unbelievers either in religion, which is legalism under Christianity, or through hell raising, which we expect from unbelievers, but believers do it too. And there are some believers who say, I'm not Christian. Then you start digging a little bit and they say, oh, I believed in Christ. What I meant was, I'm not uh, one of these stuck up people. And so they, they're saved and they are Christian. They don't even know it. And there's this great confusion in our nation because no pivot or very little of a pivot. Now, only a remnant of positive believers had an impact through the spiritual life of Israel in the Old Testament. And it's just a remnant. But uh, among that remnant, there must be at least some percentage. You can't, uh, one person can't save a nation of 300 million people. We note that from Abraham. Abraham had blessing by association to Sodom and Gomorrah, even before they Sodom and Gomorrah went under. He saved, he went into battle and saved a great amount of wealth that Sodom and Gomorrah lost in a battle. He went back and got it and brought it back to them. And they said, you, you keep some of it, Abraham. He said, no, I don't want you to think that your blessing comes from me. Blessing comes from God. I brought it back. Grace. And so first they were warned through losing a war for cycle. That is Sodom and Gomorrah. And then and at this time there was no Israel, there really there was no client nation, but there was blessing by association. And so Abraham brought back the loot to Sodom and Gomorrah, and they were grateful. But they were unbelievers and not just that, totally against any type of divine establishment, homosexuals. And they were so into their homosexuality and perversion that when our Lord came in a theophany, and that simply means our Lord came in human form along with uh, some other angels in human form, and they spoke with Lot. They were telling Lot, you need to get out of here. Judgment's coming. And then uh, at that time, they were so deep into their perversion, they saw the Lord in human form who looked unique compared to the others, and all the men immediately wanted to have sex with the uh, males, the uh, angels, and the angels of the Lord, and the Lord himself in human form, just a bunch of weirdos. So then Lot offered up his daughters, and that's weird in itself, and he was a believer. Shows reversionism. Fear. Problem with Lot was, he had his eye, well he lived outside of the spiritual life of course, no faith terrestrial, but he always had his eyes on money. Now, Abraham was quite different in that area. Abraham was already wealthy. Lot wanted to be wealthy just as Abraham. And so he looked down and he saw a lush valley and said, I want to go there. That's where I'll make my money. And then Abraham, who should have had first choice as the uncle, he said, all right, go ahead. And then he went ahead and prospered in another area all by himself away from all the homosexuals. And Lot went down and he lived among the homosexuals who had a certain trend and then Lot became extraordinarily self-righteous as he looked about him and saw all this homosexual activity and he said, I would never do such gross things. So he began, that's what it means when it says he was tortured in his soul. He wasn't tortured in his soul because he was about to accept the lifestyle of homosexuality. He was tortured in his soul because he was self-righteous. He would have never accepted that lifestyle. It wasn't his weakness. 
but it was the weakness of, so, of those in Sodom and Gomorrah. It had become a cultural acceptance. And it had to be destroyed in order for the survival of the human race. And that's where we have the Dead Sea. Nothing lives there. It's all made of salt and water. A, a huge deal of salt and water. Now only a remnant of positive believers had impact in the Old Testament just as today. Now the key to a client nation is found in history and it's also found in the history of Israel. What must a client nation do in order to retain and maintain its client nation status? Number one, it must evangelize its own population at home. Minus, we're failing in that area. Very rarely do you hear someone simply quote scripture and say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or uh, John, th that would be Acts 16.31. Or John 3.16, God loved the world so much that he gave his uniquely born son so that whosoever believes in him should never perish but have eternal life. Or uh, other passages uh, related to just believing, I am the resurrection and the life. No man comes to the Father unless he believes in me, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's evangelization and it's that simple. But we don't even do that right anymore. It's You invite Christ here and there and then at the end of that, you might put up a scripture. Well, good thing you might put up a scripture because that might be the only thing that the unbeliever is looking for. That one scripture that says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you've gone round about it, and you've tried to make a spiritually dead person invite Christ somewhere. Death can't invite. Death is dead. No dead person's ever invited you to a party. And you can't, as a dead, spiritually dead person, invite Christ anywhere. That's blasphemy. You can't invite the living God anywhere. Who are you? He invites you. You can't invite him. And it's arrogance. And when you start off thinking you're saved by arrogance, you're not. That's religion. And yes, a Baptist getting up and saying you have to invite Christ into your heart is religious. And the reason why this country is going other, under, a great portion of it has to do with Baptist. Because the Baptists used to be the pivot in the United States. Because they used to teach doctrine at once. And now it's all become part of tradition. I'm a Baptist. A Southern Baptist. I eat fried chicken on Sunday. I get together with other self-righteous people. Well, you're the reason why this country's going under. There's no Bible doctrine in the Baptist church anymore. They can't even get the gospel straight. So principle one, we're, we're failing at right now. We barely evangelize our own population at home. So there's a lot of confusion even at home. Principle two, it must communicate Bible doctrine to the believers in the nation. Well, that's gone. Nobody wants it. Very few, of course, you listening, you want it. When I say nobody, of course, I'm referencing those not listening. All six billion of the people in the world, minus 11 or 12. Number three. It is responsible for the custodianship of Bible doctrine. Now, we are the custodians. We still have that. It provides a haven for the Jews. We still do, though we have anti-Semitism in our country. We still provide a haven for the Jews, so check on that. It is responsible to send out missionaries to evangelize other nations. For the most part, we failed in that area, though we do have some grace missionaries, grace evangelistic missionaries, or, or, or missions led by Moses on Wabiko. He goes all over the world, does a wonderful job. And though it may just be a few people here and there, wherever there's positive volition, it's obvious God is sending him there. All over, different parts of the world. Now that is part of our function as a client nation. And uh, it got so bad, we're having to recruit missionaries from Africa itself. Moses on Wabiko was from Africa. He came to the United States 
the custodian of Bible doctrine, received it, and now he's going back and giving it around the world. So that means the custodianship and the missionary activity linked up. And because we failed as a nation in so many ways in missionary activity, that's why you see such large amounts of immigration. Because if we don't go to them, God will send them straight to us so they can be evangelized. But we're obviously failing in that area, just as the Jews did. The Jews were never great at missionary activity, as demonstrated by the story of Jonah. So in, we still provide a haven for the Jews. We still have the custodianship of Bible doctrine. But we have fallen so far from where we once were that it's that's why we're suffering from the third cycle of discipline. There's only two more left, people. And the fourth and the fifth become so harsh. It is almost unbelievable. And we are right on the cusp of it. You might not have experienced it yet, unless you're one of those attacked by a flash mob, and then you understand. Because it hurt when you got beat up by some mob of people that just runs around beating up people for no reason and violence and cruelty and no law and no law in that area anyway. Oh, if you move some firewood in Michigan, they may get after you. But if you're part of a flash mob, you'll get away with it. And it's just pathetic the way things are going because they don't have to go this way, but they are because of a lack of a pivot. I mean, some of the headlines that we see today, are, they should be outside of our frame of reference as a country, but they're becoming commonplace. Here's one. Bloomberg warns of riots. Where? In the United States. Protesters hit Wall Street. Why? Well, they're communists. They have declared in the United States among the disenchanted and the uh, those who are part of troublemakers, they proclaim the day of rage. Here's a report. Government motors to hand out $5,000 in bonuses. Government motors? What are they talking about? Since when has our government owned a motor business? Well, when they took over Detroit, basically, outside of Ford. Ford was the only one that said no to government money. Whenever you accept government money, there's strings attached and you become a slave. And that's true for principles in life. Now, there are those. Now, it shouldn't be true among Christians. Christians should know how to give with no strings attached. In other words, a Christian can give to another Christian and the other Christian can Walk away, say thank you, or not even say thank you. Either way, it all comes from God. And you have received a charity from someone who has given to you out of no compulsion. And that's the way it should be, as far as giving is concerned. And if they did not want to give, they'd just say no, and that's fine too. It's theirs. It's not everybody's, it's theirs. And so we do have the concept of charity. And among Christians, and even among unbelievers, there can be charity and normal compassion. But when you have a government, they don't have compassion. They're bureaucrats. There's no bureaucrat with compassion. A bureaucrat uh, thinks that all the money they've got, they, well, a bureaucrat thinks that the money of the entire United States is theirs. And they're so smart, they should distribute it. They never, they may have never created a job in their whole life. They may have never had any money outside of the government handing them money. And then they get into power and they say, all this money's mine. I will distribute it as I wish. I will declare winners and losers. And they took over. As a result, you see the bailout of the auto industry is dumb, for one thing. That auto industry is going to fail anyway. It should have been left to fail on its own so that other industry could replace it who would run it better. 
That's what depressions are for and recessions, to clean out the waste. But government steps in and says, no, 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 no. We can't have, we can't have this occurring. And as a result, all you do is prolong what would have been a simple bump in the road. That's what happened in the Great Depression. It was prolonged. Uh, we didn't get out of the Great Depression because of policy emanating from government. It was prolonged because of policy emanating from government. Oh, and you weren't taught that in school, so I understand if you say, now wait a minute, Roosevelt saved the country, and he brought, he brought the United States out of depression. I understand you were taught that way. I was taught that way in school, but I read the book, and it said just the opposite. And even the book was teaching it that way, but I was looking at the statistics in the book, and the statistics did not match with what the book was saying. They had a graph, the Great Depression. Each year, now they, they figure, well, students are dumb, and they're not going to care, and we can just say whatever we want and still put up a graph that contradicts what we're saying, and it won't matter. They'll still buy into the big lie, and they, they most of them do. But I saw it and said, wait, these statistics show that things got worse during the Great Depression, and yet this book is telling me that things got better. And I brought that up with my liberal teacher. Dumb idea. If you know the answer, just keep it to yourself. Don't bring it up to your authority. I was a little hard-headed. I wanted to make a point. I wanted to, somebody else to see what I saw. He was an obnoxious teacher. He's probably dead now and in hell. He was old. Well, anyway... Obama announces tax hike on rich. That's a, 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 I won't say anything. Here's something. Warren Buffett wants the people to pay, or rich people to pay more in taxes, and this article says, Warren Buffett, send in a check. And we have all of this type of socialism. And we have all this type of internationalism. We even have postal service facing grim new reality. We even have the idea that our postal service will go bankrupt and won't be able to perform anymore. I don't see that happening, but, you know, we are broke anyway. We're just printing the money, and it means extraordinary inflation. I wouldn't want the job for the next term. And whoever gets it, they're going to have just as harsh of a time, if not a harder time than Obama, because these things that are going on take a hard time, a long time before the effect occurs. For example, when they lower an interest rate at the Federal Reserve, it doesn't have any effect on the economy until about six months later. And when you're printing trillions and trillions of dollars, the effect of that doesn't occur until later. Now, if Obama gets reelected, well, it'll be on him. And what will be is terrible inflation and everything else. And I say it will be on him in terms of how people think and human viewpoint. It's really on believers who have failed. If he's booted out and someone else comes in and tries to change things, it's going to be very painful in the process. Because any economic growth that occurs now any of it will come with an extraordinary amount of inflation. We already have it, but it will be it will skyrocket. You cannot print money and not have inflation. It's it's insane. You can't do it. And if people could spend their way to prosperity, well, they would have figured that out a long time ago. And if the country that spent the most money was the most prosperous, then uh, <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't make sense because it's easy to print money. It's hard to make it. It's easy to print it. Now in Europe, they're falling all apart. Workers are in the streets. People protesting. I don't know if you saw a while back what happened in Great Britain or if not, no, the United Kingdom. They had riots that lasted for quite a while. And then uh, the greatest selling product in the United Kingdom were American-made baseball bats. They can't own guns, so they got a baseball bat, so that if some 
hoodlum would come in and try to steal from them. They could beat them with a baseball bat. Now, in the United States, if anything like that occurs, there will be war in the streets. People shooting at one another, either because of the color of their skin or whatnot. All that can happen. And there's just a thin line keeping it from happening right now. And that has to do with those very few who have, who have reached Play Roma to Theu. And that's part of blessing by association. But some of these articles are so foreign to what we would usually see that it's, uh, it's sad. This should not be happening. And it would not happen if believers would get with the word of God and stop messing around. And I mean even those believers who used to call themselves doctrinal, and they may still call themselves doctrinal, but they've gone in some weird way toward where they'll, they will accept a little yeast now. Well, they're leavened. And some of them, as soon as uh, the colonel departed from the scene, they were so anxious to find a new person they hop from here to there. Just because uh, Colonel Thame went to be with the Lord does not change the fact that he's the greatest pastor since the Apostle Paul. And just because the Apostle Paul is with the Lord does not mean he's no longer the great Apostle Paul. You see what I'm getting at? It doesn't matter. Apostle Paul is still the greatest believer of all time, whether with the Lord or on the earth. And Colonel Thame is the greatest pastor of since Paul, whether on the earth or with the Lord. So just cool it. You don't have to hop here and there looking for somebody else. You have you have the doctrine. You loved it. What happened to you? And you're the reason why the country's going under because you developed it. It wasn't that way at the start. That was your first love, Bible doctrine. And you, when you first heard about rebound, you loved it. And you loved it because you found out grace. And you said, I don't have to feel guilty anymore? Man, man, that's the first thing I loved. I don't have to feel guilty? Really? I don't have to feel guilty. That's freedom. Whoa, what a load off the shoulders. And that's how... Anyone has been who's learned the rebound technique because we're all sinners. And now you don't even want the word uttered anymore. No, no, don't say it that way. Say confession. Say something else. No, 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 no. We can't put it that way anymore. The thing times have changed. People want to understand. Blah, blah. You understood it and you loved it. Don't be foolish. You've departed from your first love. That's your problem. And now you have itching ears. You didn't in the past. Now you do. And in the Bible, it says you have itching ears, hearing what you wish to hear. And that all has to be, has to do with the fact you're not accepting an authority anymore. You have to accept the authority of a pastor teacher, dead or alive. You have to accept that authority because the authority emanates from the word of God. And if the pastor is teaching the word of God correctly, that's where he gets his authority. Bible doctrine. Not personality. Bible doctrine. Now, of course, he must reprove, and he can't always be flowers, lilies, bonnets, and bunnies. He can from time to time, but not always. There's a way to motivate from a negative, and this is what I mean in English, from a negative point, and that is negative motivation. Such as, if you do not execute the protocol plan of God, you will be ashamed in a resurrection body. That's negative motivation. In other words, if you do not do it, bad things happen. So you're motivated to do it because you don't want bad things to happen. But then there's other motivation that's positive motivation, and both of them work together. And I could say to you, if you execute the protocol plan of God, you can turn the world upside down. Now that's positive motivation. And a pastor must use both. And you can't uh, just rely on all positive things and fluff. All you'll have is a fluff congregation. 
who does not know what it means to be reproved or corrected, and all you have are a bunch of people with arrogance getting together and developing cliques, developing a special language in which they talk to each other with hallelujahs and amens, and they make themselves feel so great and wonderful because they speak in a certain way that the rest of the world does not speak. And you are foolish and unbelievers laugh at you and your legalism, and your arrogance, and your hypocrisy, and I laugh along with them, because you're gross. You're enemies of the cross, and you don't even know it. Here's something related to the decline of this country. Anti-Israel subway signs in New York City. And there's just so, there's so much pitiful news out there, I don't even want to go through it. That's what occurs when there's no pivot. Now, either Generation Y is going to get up. My generation, we've about passed the point of no return. We're about to reach the middle age point. And once you get past middle age, if you haven't responded, more than likely you're not going to. A lot of people begin to respond in their 20s. And in their 30s. But once they get middle age, you start to get set in your ways. You've heard of that. They say it in the South all the time. Ah, uh, so-and-so's just set in their ways. Once you get to a certain age, you're set in your ways. A lot of people understand that who may not even be, who may not even understand Bible doctrine. They understand people getting set in their ways over time. For example, somebody told Rush Limbaugh to why don't you go to John McCain and tell him he's wrong in this area? And Rush Limbaugh said, John McCain's 70 some years old. I'm a kid to him. He said in his ways, he's not going to listen to me. And he wouldn't have. And when John McCain would come out and say, I'm my own man, you better believe it. He was set in his ways. Because he'd been living that he had settled it, you know, by the time you're 60 and 70, you are who you are. Now, when you're in your 20s, you're still running around talking about finding yourself. And some people even take that into their 30s. I'm trying to find myself. By the time you're 40, if you haven't found yourself, then you just become one of them old hippies who doesn't know what to do. They made a song about that. But then you're set in your ways. You're just a hippie all your life. Well, that's the problem with the client nation USA. The problem is no pivot. And there's a lot of distractions out there related to politics. And uh, there's a lot of distractions related to, let's blame the president. Let's blame Congress. Let's blame whoever. Look in the mirror first. Have you made Bible doctrine number one? If you have not, take a big stamp. It says traitor and stamp it on your forehead. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us as to what it means to be a client nation and as to what it means to live the unique spiritual life so as to be part of the pivot that can turn the world upside down. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.